All right, so um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Mike Gavin. I and Ricky Burrell are, are coordinate the seminar series for the Human Dimension and Natural Resources, which we call Frontiers in Social Science, uh, uh, Conservation Social Science. And uh, this year we have a, a theme on, on diversity in, in conservation. And uh, I wanted to go do a quick pitch for the rest of the series, which we'll put out emails and posters and we'll just bombard you with, uh, with things. Uh, and if you want to follow uh, the department on social media, um, you'll also find uh, more information about the seminar series. But we have the next uh, speaker is on March 22nd, which is Dominique W. Chavez, who's a PhD student in our department, uh, speaking on uh, human dimensions of climate change, responsible research engagement with indigenous knowledge systems and communities on March 22nd, same time, same place. And uh, March 29th, we'll have uh, Maria Elena uh, Wambachano from Brown University coming, and we have a whole series coming for the rest of the semester. Um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce um, Camille Dungy today. I will say, we, we put out a call uh, for uh, suggestions for speakers, and you were by far the number one request. <laughs> um, so it meant several different people uh, emailed saying, oh, we need to get Camille over. And, and I found at the university that it's really tricky to make these connections across not only distance, as you just discovered, but, uh, you know, but, but uh, across disciplines uh, to make these connections. So it's great uh, to make a connection uh, with you, Camille. Um, and so let, let me, quick introduction to, to Camille. Um, she's the author of four different collections of poetry, uh, including most recently, Trophic Cascade. And uh, her debut collection of personal essays is, is uh, titled A Guidebook to Relative Strangers, and it is currently a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Uh, she's also edited uh, many different volumes, including uh, Black Nature, Four Centuries of African American Nature Poetry. Uh, and Camille has received many different honors, uh, including the uh, American Book Award, two different Northern California Book Awards, uh, two AA, uh, NAACP uh, Image Award nominations. Uh, and she's also the recipient of many different fellowships and grants, including from uh, the National Endowment of the Arts. Uh, and her poems and essays have been published in Best American Poetry and in the 100 Best African American Poems, uh, and in 30 different anthologies and over 100 different journals. Uh, and um, we're very lucky because she's a professor of English here at uh, CSU. So welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you doing today? Um, while you have your calendars out and you added that great list of things, let me do a little cross-disciplinary addition to your list. On April 26th, um, the Creative Writing Reading Series in the English Department is bringing the poet Ross Gay, um, who is a, a, an acclaimed environmental writer himself, and also a, a, a community environmental activist. He's part of a um, community garden um, and a kind of movement for like distribution of produce and joy <laughs> is the way that the, so they like, sh they share the produce of this community garden with the community um, in Indiana where he lives. And so I think like to hear another, he's also another poet and creative nonfiction writer who is not just writing kind of disconnected nature poems, but is really putting into practice um, this environmental ethic in his work right here on campus, April 26th, and the Cherokee Ballroom at 7.30. We're trying to fill the ballroom. <laughs> so what I thought I would do is actually um, read a few things. Um, a section from an essay and, and then a couple poems, and then I could talk a little bit about the um, editing and collection of Black Nature, and then um, we can open to questions. So this, this essay excerpt I'm um, going to read from, the essay is called A Good Hike. Outside long enough, I lose the contours of my body and become part of something larger. What I watch for on a good hike are moments of permission. The times my interactions with what is beyond me provide opportunities to know the world in ways different from how I'm used to knowing it. I lose track of my own inhibitions and begin to wonder just what I might be able to do if I allowed myself the full scope of my potential. 
I become more willing to test my own limits in these circumstances, and I discover the particular freedom that accompanies physical accomplishment coupled with plenty of fresh air in the lungs. A good hike is an exercise in mindfulness, not just racing up and down a hill, but attending to each object passed along the way. The new goose turd on a boulder that suggests a late or aborted migration. The little patches of lichen clumped along the trail, looking like discarded blood orange peels, slowly drying in late autumn sun. When I am hiking well, I marvel at everything I see and all I am able to do. A good hike takes me places I haven't been before. Not all hikes are good hikes. One can race up and down a hill in a state of mindlessness that attends to very little. During the portion of the November afternoon when I fractured my fibula, I wasn't mindfully watching the path. If I had become, at some point earlier on that hike, part of something larger, I returned to an acute consciousness of my individual limits the moment I slipped on wet leaves and caught the toe of my right sneaker on a camouflaged root. The single explicative I shouted was enough to make everyone around me conscious of the contours of my body. I crumpled to the ground, said, I just broke my ankle, and gripped both hands around the site of the injury. If you've ever noticed the way a hurt animal curls around itself, pained and snarling, needing assistance, but daring anyone to come near, you have a picture of what I look like in the Adirondacks that November. So we had, we had about a mile to walk to the car. Um, it was a slow mile. <laughs> <laughs> we had like a couple of, of ways that we did it. One was like this one guy um, carried me piggyback and then when he tired there would be like the fireman's carry. <clears throat> then it went back to the shul two shoulder hobble. Then Drew would carry me piggyback again before he removed his birding binoculars his glasses. Each time I climbed on his back, he walked as far as he could. Then we returned to the two-shoulder hobble, letting two of the other men smell Drew as he wiped the sweat from his neck and forehead. I couldn't tell you how long we kept at it. The men's speed picked up, which would have been a good thing, but for the fact that this sent my leg jostling to such a degree, I had to beg them to stop. And I should also tell you that I was like two months pregnant. So I was like at that like, like intense nausea stage of the development of a human fetus, um, <laughs> which just didn't, didn't help. <laughs> then I came up with a perfect solution. I collapsed my hands and knees and moved forward of my own volition. No more jostling ankle. Sweet relief. You're going to crawl, asked Matthew. This is going to work. You have carried me far enough. I can do the rest on my own. Look, I'm moving pretty quickly. For a short while, no one said a thing. I was clearly set on this solution. I left no room for argument, and it was true. I was moving at a clip that exceeded what we'd managed thus far. The sun was positioned at the angle where it rests just before it races down toward the horizon. All of us knew we didn't have much time before dark. Forward I crawled. Chip, the man who had proposed this trip in the first place, the man who wanted to see what the next generation of American environmentalist writers valued most, and so invited a group of relatively young nature writers to the Adirondacks for a confab about the future of the genre, Chip looked on at my progress with speechless horror. <laughs> he told me later he was terrified some other group of hikers would come along and discover all these white people standing around watching a black girl crawl through the woods. <laughs> Chip wasn't entirely off base in his assessment of the situation. Part of why we treat people horribly, why we make the one subjugated other among us crawl while the rest walk through the woods 
why we damage people's bodies or ridicule them, why we work to break people down. It's because we want another human being to give body and will over to us so we can do with it what we desire. Pain, embarrassment, hopelessness, fear, a combination of these can erase pride from a human spirit in short order. Once pride is absent, control is that much easier to command. Those of us who are conscious of human history know the pervasiveness with which one person's will has been pressed on another. And as environmentalists, we were well aware of the ease with which people set up distinctions between themselves and anything they choose to categorize as separate from and therefore subject to themselves. What Chip feared was that some outsider would look at our party and assume that a play of dominance was underway. He was afraid it would look as if he were the one working to subjugate me. Chip was silent on the mountain because his concern about the appearance of oppression was so great. Yet, he was able to describe his reaction at breakfast, laughing while he did so, because by the next day, the concern felt humorous, no longer a real threat. The whole time we were working to get me off the mountain, I thought I was worried about the pain in my ankle and the burden of my weight. I realize now that my other big worry, what I feared the whole time on the hill, was that I would have to let go of my pride. These are the ways human history cross-pollinates with all our interactions in the world. I make it off the mountain. <laughs> See, essay continues. Um, I actually just confirmed a date in, in the fall from the woman who was the first responder who diagnosed the broken ankle on the mountain. And like in the essay, I talk about like the ways that she kept me up on Drew's back. Just a little bit of, just a little bit of, you know, affectionate <laughs> butt lifting <laughs> that happened <laughs> along the way. When I finally came down from the mountain and, you know, like right when, it, right when the ankle was finally in a stage where it was healed enough that I didn't need crutches, then I was like obscenely pregnant, you know, it's like I, it's, it was like nine months of just pain and instability, <laughs> and, um, which is a really great place to write from. <laughs> um, and it just made me think about the ways that um, when I write, when I travel and do like all this outdoorsy stuff that I do as a black person, that there's always this like extra, there's this extra risk that comes with it. And there's these kind of um, memory risks that have nothing to do with me, right? But like spaces where I wander and I just think about what has happened on these particular landscapes so that I can't kind of just be particularly free and open. Um, but then I also love it. Right? And so, and, and I find joy and wonderful experience and camaraderie in that space. And so that kind of complication between being in a space where I find myself at peace and I find a, a home and a, and a, like a, a, a claim uh, that I can stake there and also where it could all go wrong really, really quickly and I will be the one um, who's at the greatest risk, right, of all those things being wrong. Like that kind of just adds, um, adds to my perceptiveness, I think, when I, when I move through these spaces. Um, so, so this is one more poem that kind of does that, um, that kind of interplay that I think I'm sort of always doing in my mind between natural history questions, preservation questions, um, um, which species get to be where <laughs> um, and what that means, right? Like our, our constant play between do we call them exotic species or invasive species? Right? It's very different um, <sighs> denotations and connotations from both of those phrases. Um, all these questions play into this poem that I'm going to read. It's set in the San Francisco Bay. There's an island in the San Francisco Bay which um, you all may know about it. It's called Angel Island. It was, uh, people call it the Ellis Island of the West. 
the main difference with um, between Angel Island and Ellis Island is you only ended up on Ellis Island if there was an issue with your immigration status. So it actually is much more uh, has much more in common with our um, modern day detention centers than with our um, modern day um, what do you call that uh, global entry <laughs> <laughs> customs point. Thank you. What I know I cannot say. We sailed to Angel Island, and for several hours, I did not think of you. When I couldn't stop myself finally from thinking of you, it was not really you, but the trees. Not really the trees, but their strange pods blooming for a while longer. A bloom more like the fringed fan at the tip of a peacock's tail than anything I'd call a flower. And so I was thinking about flowers and what we value in a flower more than I was thinking of the island or its trees and much more than I was thinking of you. Recursive language ties us together, linguists say. I am heading down this road. I am heading down this road despite the caution signs and the narrow shoulders. I am heading down the curvy road despite the caution signs and the narrow shoulders because someone I fell in love with once lived around here. Right there, that is an example of recursive language. Every language, nearly every language in the world demands recursion. Few things bring us together more than our need to spell out our intentions, which helps explain the early 20th century Chinese prisoners who squat, scratch poems into walls on Angel Island, and why a Polish detainee wrote his mother's name in 1922. I was here, they wanted to tell us. And by here, they meant the island, and they also meant the world. And by the island, they meant the world they knew, and they also meant the world they left, and the world they wanted to believe could be theirs. The world they knew required passwords. Think of Angel Island Immigration Station as purgatory, the guide explained. He told tales of paper fathers, picture brides, the fabrications of familiarity so many lives depended on. Inquiries demanded consistency despite the complications of interpretation. In English, one would ask, how many windows were in your house in the village? How many ducks did you keep? What was the shape of the birthmark on your father's left cheek? In Japanese, Cantonese, Danish, Punjabi, the other answered. Then, it all had to come back to English. The ocean is wide and treacherous between one home and the other. There can be no turning back, no correction, once what, what is said is said. Who can blame the Chinese detainees who carved poems deep into the wood on Angel Island's walls? Who can blame the Salvadoran who etched his village's name? Few things tie us together more than our need to dig up the right words to justify ourselves. Travelers and students, we sailed into the bay, disembarked on Angel Island. I didn't think about you. Which is to say, the blue gum eucalyptus is considered a threat, though we brought it across oceans to help us. Desired first for its timber, because it grows quickly and was expected to provide a practical fortune. And when it did not, enlisted as a windbreak, desired still, because it is fast growing and practical, the blue gum has colonized the California coastal forest, squeezing out native plants, dominating the landscape, and increasing the danger of fire. I should hate the blue gum eucalyptus. But from the well of their longing, by which I mean to say from their pods, you know what I mean, I hope, their original homes. From the well of their longing, blooms explode like fireworks. I love them for this. Do you hear me? I absolve you. You are far too beautiful and singular to blame. So I'm going to read one more poem. Um, it's the first poem in my first book, and it's also here in Black Nature. Um, and just to bring it all in a nice circle, I wrote it on a hike, or after a hike. I've been living on the 
East Coast for a very long time. I grew up in, I was born in Colorado, I grew up in Southern California. Um, and uh, then I lived, after college, I lived for 11 years on the East Coast. I like to joke that when I moved to the East Coast, I went, I went to grad school straight out of college and I got like a free ride. And so I was like, well, it'll be a two year free trial offer of the, of the American East, you know? <laughs> but like when I made that pact, you gotta be careful, right? And, like I think that the spirit, whatever, like read it, like I wrote two like Roman numeral, you know, without the crossbar <laughs> over the top <laughs> and they read it as 11. That's, that's my justification. Like straight 11 years. And then I wrote a poem I published in my first collection I, like, that was all about like how much I missed California and like the, these particulars, like particular smells that happen as a result of the, of the uh, flora in California um, that I was missing and like that like ocean breeze mixed with like manzanita and, um, and citrus flowers. Like, the, like you just, I, you may get it someplace in the Mediterranean, but you don't get it anywhere else in America. Um, and I was, I wrote this poem and I published it in the, in the month that the book in which this poem about how, in the poem was like, I've been gone a long time, but I'll be back. I got a job offer back in California. <laughs> Writing is powerful. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I went on this hike. I was in the Slot Canyons in Utah. Um, I'd been living in Virginia and North Carolina for all those years, and I like did this Utah Slot Canyon hike, and I was like, oh, I love this mm -hmm. landscape. And I went back to my friend's house and wrote this poem. Language. Silence is one part of speech. The war cry of wind down a mountain pass, another. A stranger's voice echoing through lonely valleys. A lover's voice rising so close, it's your own tongue. These are keys to cipher. The way the high hawk's key unlocks the throat of the sky and the coyote's yip knocks it shut. The way the aspen's bells conform to the breeze while the rapid's drum defines resistance. Sage speaks with one voice, pinion with another. Rock, wind her hand, water her brush, spells and then scatters her demands. Some notes tear and pebble our paths, some notes gather the bank we map our lives around. So that's like a little sampling of um, a bunch of different kind of angles where I take this kind of environmental imagination in, in my own writing. And you heard in a good hike, I mean, there's, like it was a good hike, as, <laughs> as it turns out. Like we all have really good memories of that hike. Um, and, and, and it was beautiful and wonderful. And in the first part of the essay, I really, after I break my ankle, I kind of moved back to the beginning where, like, I made this amazing ascendancy and it was fantastic. And I was like crawling through caves and remembering my feeling of being a child and um, where I got to hike through caves. And like, I just, like, I was pregnant, but like alive and nobody was weighing me down and it was wonderful. And, and partly because of that, I wasn't paying attention, right? Partly because of like how at home and comfortable I had felt in it, I wasn't paying attention and I slipped. And I also was like not, not properly equipped, right? I was like, we're just going on a hike one day. I don't need to take my big hiking boots all the way across the country for the one day of the hike, right? Because this is what I usually rock, right? And so like this is like, there's a big difference between that and the hiking boots. And so I just had like some tennis shoes or something, which is never wear tennis shoes on a hike, right? <laughs> just like never enough grip unless they're trail shoes, right? Um, and so I think a little bit about like what that means, what, like, what it means that certain people are always outfitted and ready for these spaces and some of us aren't, right? Um, and, but also just that camaraderie, right? Of being in that community of people who care about the same things. And as a result, really, of caring about all these things, we're also able to care for me, right? In the way that I needed to. So that sort of complicated version of what it means to be environmentally engaged and environmentally aware, um, coupled with gender and race and culture and all those other pieces. And then you heard in that second poem, or the middle 
poem that I read, that sort of historical perspective, right? This fact that like on this island um, in the middle of the San Francisco Bay, I'm reminded of like all kinds of histories of immigration, right? That aren't just, it's not just black American culture. There's like all these kind of cross pollinations, but also these sometimes like bad decisions we make as environmental stewards, right? Like, probably shouldn't have brought the eucalyptus. <laughs> it's probably not so good. But it does smell really great, right? <laughs> and it is really pretty, and it grows really fast. But like, how many other examples do we have of that, where we're like trying to be, we're trying to be good stewards, and we make really bad decisions, right? Um, that have kind of long-term, um, detrimental effects uh, that we work or like that's the best case scenario we're trying to be good we're trying to be good stewards then there's those other scenarios of like we just like snails are yummy to eat so we'll bring snails right and then like snails will take over the entirety of the American West because nobody eats them here but they thrive right <laughs> or kudzu Let's bring kudzu, right? That was like supposed to be a mitigation kind of situation. Or it was a land cover, right? They were just going to be like, it'll be better than English ivy, which is not a good thing to have here either, right? So we have all these kinds of things that we bring that are like human folly um, doesn't allow us to see the long-term effects. And I think as a writer, um, I can look at those things historically and what the, what the positive and negative fallouts of those have been. Um, and I can kind of, by doing that enough times, we can make some sorts of predictions sometimes about what, what would it mean if I were to landscape my yard with something that I really love from my time in Iowa that probably doesn't belong in my garden in Fort Collins, right? Um, and so that's one of the powers of writing, I think. But when I, when I couple with it, when I couple with it, that environmental ethos with that um, cultural, social um, ethos that has to do with being an a African-American woman, like what, what are those sort of extra layers of complication um, that that means? I have a student right now who's um, finishing up his MFA thesis, and it's a really, really good thesis. He's from, he's from the, like a ranch outside of Steamboat. Um, and he like, has these wonderful poems that he's writing about the American West. Um, and he had all these wonderful poems about mending fence, right? And like what it meant to sort of go every spring and mend fence. And every one of his poems is about like the hard work on the body and about how it brought him and his father and his grandfather together. And I was like, this is great. And this is real. And you cannot finish this book without thinking about the complicated reality of the fence in the American West, right? Like, what does that mean to Native American populations? What does it mean to, to natural, non-human species, right? Like, how has barbed wire changed the landscape culturally, historically, human, and like, we can't write these poems without doing that. You can really praise the time that you're spending with your grandfather on the fence. That is, can be true. But you can't do that without ignoring the, like, horrible, bloody history of barbed wire in Colorado, right? Um, and so to me, that's what it is. It's like this sort of just opening up and expansion. The moment you bring human history into these natural history stories, I, to me, it gets exciting right? <laughs> um, and broader. And also, it means that we can make better decisions as we move forward.